Oregon football is set to resume spring practice in Eugene next week, and today I'm taking a deep dive into the top storylines I'll be tracking when the Ducks hit the field. And we're back like we never left. Oregon fans, what's going on? How we living? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Ducks Dish podcast. I'm your host, Max Torres. Happy to have you along for another episode. Um, if you guys are watching on YouTube at Oregon Football Max Torres, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know how you're feeling about Oregon football with the Ducks set to resume spring practice next week. And then if you're listening to us on your podcasting platform of choice, appreciate the five-star reviews or any kind comments over there. Appreciate you guys following along and uh, tracking, um, you know, my Oregon football coverage. But I don't know if it was just, uh, you know, waking up after a good night's sleep, got a good workout in, was bumping some good music this morning, but I'm just fired up today. And I think a small part of it, or maybe a big part of it, is because the Ducks return to spring practice next week. Um, players are coming back to Eugene. We're seeing it on their stories. They're back in Eugene after kind of uh, flocking back home uh, to their uh, respective areas, uh, hometowns. We know that Oregon is a program that recruits nationally. So uh, everyone's coming back to Eugene and they're ready to get after it, to kick it into high gear, to ramp things up on the practice fields at the Hatfield Dowling Complex and in the weight room with Wilson Love and his coaching staff. So today we're going to be breaking down the top storylines that I'm going to be tracking as the Ducks resume spring practice. But one other small note, um, in case you guys missed it yesterday, I had uh, an awesome episode of the Oregon Recruiting Hour where I talked about Elijah Rushing, rushing, excuse me, Elijah Rushing, a five-star defensive end edge rusher that uh, just locked in a visit to Oregon for the spring game. Tons of big time visitors will be in town for the spring game. I want to say it's around five, five stars, at least four or five stars, but you know, I'm going to be working to confirm that list for you guys over on ducksdigest.com and uh, keep you up to date on all the big names that are going to be coming. But we talked about Elijah rushing on that episode, talked about Gary Bryant jr. The USC wide receiver transfer, I talked about my thoughts on where Oregon stands in his recruitment, if they're maybe going to be able to get a commitment from him. And then I also talked about uh, Aaron Nolan, the 2024 quarterback who is nearing a decision and might get out to Oregon before he makes his ultimate, his final commitment, that decision coming on April 8th. So a lot of really good stuff there. Make sure you guys check that one out. If you haven't already, that's on YouTube as well as your podcasting platform of choice. So, What are some of the spring storylines that we are tracking as the Ducks get ready for spring practice, for spring practice to resume, I should say? I think one of the biggest ones that I'm going to be looking at is Oregon needs to develop their backup quarterbacks. That, of course, that conversation starts with Ty Thompson, the 2021 quarterback signee, five-star quarterback, the highest rated quarterback that the Ducks have ever signed out of high school. You guys know all the uh, accolades and distinctions that Ty Thompson brought with him to Eugene, but um, you know, things haven't quite panned out for him so far, at least in terms of when he has seen the field, he hasn't really looked quite ready for, you know, those big moments. And a lot of people look at the Washington game, which I think is definitely, uh, you know, an example, an appearance that is worth mentioning. Um, I don't think he didn't throw any passes in that game, but We all know how it went. Bo Nix got hurt on that pivotal drive against the Huskies. And then Ty Thompson came in and uh, they they weren't really able to move the ball. So that's a really tough spot to come in. But really, it it just proves that the Ducks need to develop their backup quarterbacks this year. Because as of right now, this team is going to go as far as Bo Nix can take them. Um, You know, a lot of big time additions on the roster, whether it comes from the high school ranks, the transfer portal ranks. It really looks like this team, you know, kind of starts and ends with Bo Nix's success. And that is because he was, you know, at one point a Heisman contender last year. So you need to keep Bo Nix healthy. Obviously, that's a huge thing. But if he goes down, you at least need to have a number two that can operate the offense, move the ball and, um, you know, take care of the ball as well. And that's not really something that the Ducks have had 
uh, in recent years. And it's really becoming kind of a, a luxury, I think, in, um, in, in college football. You know, which teams can actually have solid number twos, solid backups that are capable of putting out an offense that has no drop off compared to the starter. That's a tough thing to do. Um, but you know the story with Ty Thompson. He's you know incredibly physically gifted. He's uh, super athletic, has probably the strongest arm on that team, but the processing speed hasn't necessarily been there for Thompson. And there's other factors too, like you know consistency or lack thereof uh, in terms of a consistent offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach. He came to Oregon when Joe Moorhead was, in, was uh, the OC, and then he switched things up with Kenny Dillingham, a fellow Arizona native, and then now he has Will Stein. So this is his third offensive coordinator, uh, which doesn't exactly make it easy to, you know, develop as a quarterback. Those are kind of, you know, some odds working against you. And we know that when he's gotten into games, he hasn't necessarily had the the best players uh, that he's, you know, playing with at that time because, you know, sometimes they're blowouts or the game's over. But that doesn't change the fact that the Ducks need to develop their backup quarterbacks and the other quarterback in the conversation there, along with Thompson, is 2023 quarterback signee, early enrollee, true freshman, Austin Novosad from Dripping Springs, Texas. He was an Adidas All-American, and uh, I got to see him in person in San Antonio during my coverage of that game uh, and you know other Oregon players that were there. But uh, he's a he's a guy that uh, I think Oregon's hoping can uh, push Thompson and at least, you know, just continue aiding in his development and and who knows maybe Novasad will be a guy who who's uh you know ready to be that backup but right now I think we're all expecting Ty Thompson to be the primary backup um that said Lanning did talk about Novasad's progression following Oregon's second spring practice saying quote I think he's really smart I think that shows in the way he attacks each day and plays I know he wants a couple plays back today and I know he's going to be a guy that cares enough that he's going to learn from it Excited about his progress. He throws a tight spiral, does a good job with the ball, but he needs to deliver it in the right location a few more times. So it sounds like, you know, his accuracy may not exactly be there just yet, but I think that that's probably to be expected. I don't think that Oregon signed Novosad with any uh, with any plans of him being the guy. I talked to him and he said that he was really happy with the quarterback situation shaping up the way it was at Oregon with Bo Nix being the projected starter. He was saying, if I'm going to sit behind somebody you know, for a year or whatever, if I have to bide my time, I want it to be somebody who's going to the NFL. And uh, Bo Nix looks like he is on that projection, uh, that trajectory as it stands right now. So I think you have some some good options there in that quarterback room, still pretty thin. Uh, you have a couple walk-ons in that room as well. You know, Marcus Sanders is one of them. Jake Van Dyne uh, is, is another. And um, I think it's just interesting to see how the room looks now because I thought it might have even made sense it wouldn't have been crazy if Oregon actually got another quarterback from the portal this offseason. That hasn't happened, or maybe hasn't happened yet. I'm not trying to suggest that they're going after that, but when you look at the quarterback depth chart, Oregon's looking for that number two guy. So if they had a guy who had played some more college football, maybe had some starting experience somewhere, I think that would set them up for success, and they'd probably be feeling more confident about where they are with their quarterback situation right now because aside from Bo Nix, that quarterback room is very, very unknown, and uh, a backup looks like a pretty significant question mark right now. So I think that Oregon needs to develop their backup quarterbacks this spring, certainly in fall camp, but that's going to be a major storyline that we're tracking when the Ducks resume spring practice. All right, the next storyline that I'm going to be tracking when the Ducks return to spring practice is building out depth in the front seven. Let's start with the defensive line because this is a group that is absolutely loaded. Uh, I think one of the most exciting storylines around this defensive line group for Oregon, for Dan Lanning, Tony Tuioti, uh, and the rest of the coaching staff is Popo Amavai is back for one more season. You know, this is a guy who was, uh, you know, an all conference selection before he got injured, um, missed all of last year. So he's going to have to be knocking off some rust here in the spring. Um, but he's one of the best defensive linemen that the or that Oregon has right now. Uh, you know, he's someone that I think can really do a good job of manning down that interior of the defensive line for Oregon. And you can't forget about the other guys that they have in that room. Some big time talent coming back from a year ago. Brandon Dorless is obviously the big guy in that discussion. Uh, I think with the depth that Oregon has on the defensive line, that's going to allow Brandon Dorless to move around. And really, I think for 
Oregon to put him in the best spot to be successful because he's a super athletic guy, definitely got a high motor, and um, he's one of the most gifted defensive linemen that the Ducks have on their roster right now. Uh, then we talked about Casey Rogers, who was a massive success after transferring over from Nebraska following Tony Tuioti, as well as Jordan Riley, who comes who came over from Nebraska last year. The Ducks don't have Jordan Riley anymore. He's the lone departure from last year's group. Um, but this is a really veteran group and a, a pretty productive group, too. Um, who else do you have? You have Keon Ware Hudson. You have Sam Taimani on that defensive line as well. You know, we can talk about the defensive ends or the edge rushers. It's kind of a different group, but we'll talk about them in, in, in just a moment. Um, I think Keon Ware Hudson is probably poised to take another step. I think he's kind of flown under the radar, but had some pretty good play. Uh, during his time at Oregon, has battled a couple of injuries, which make it hard to stay on the field, obviously. Um, but this is one of the most ex uh, experienced groups that the Ducks have and probably one of the deepest groups that the Ducks have uh, as it stands right now in spring football. It's so important to return production and return experience um, along the lines of scrimmage. And uh, that's something that Oregon has that not every team in, in the country has. So it's definitely something fortunate for them. Uh, also talking about scheme continuity carrying over from last year. I think that's an added bonus as well. So this group is super experienced on the interior. And then you signed a number of really talented defensive linemen as well. Uh, you know, you look at Tavita Pomee, Amari Washington, Michael Gardner, you know, all those guys and a couple more names that I, I, I probably forgot to mention, but maybe you can have to have a really experienced group and then to have a bunch of guys coming in uh, from the high school ranks to learn behind them is really, really good. And I think that that's kind of the position that Oregon wants to find themselves in uh, now and moving forward, you know, just because you have a really good first group or a really good position group with some vets, you want to bring some guys in that can learn behind them uh, and then build towards the future. I think that's always what college football is doing. You got to focus on the here and now, but you got to juggle that at the same time and look into the future as well. So depth in the front seven is definitely strong. We started off talking about the defensive line, now let's push it out a little bit more to talk about the defensive ends and the edge rushers. The edge rushers are a, a really interesting group right now because I think that, um, you know, Oregon doesn't have as many proven options as they probably want from a year ago, right? Uh, you lose DJ Johnson from last season and then Mace Buna comes back. He's He looks like he's really kind of maybe taking the next step in his game. I think he's been at Oregon for a while, so some fans are, were hoping to see what we saw from Funa last season. His biggest play probably was that pick six against Wazoo that uh, ultimately helped Oregon win the game. And uh, I think that was a huge game because it showed us that Oregon is capable of being a team that can put together a comeback, something that we haven't seen in recent years, certainly under Mario Cristobal with that ground and pound offense. Um, so, yeah, I think Mace Funa is kind of, you know, one of the, the best returner that they have, but we got to talk about Jordan Birch, you know, Jordan Birch, big, big time addition from the transfer portal coming over from South Carolina. Um, you know, you're really looking at Tosh LePoy and Dan Lanning to help take his game to the next level. Uh, I think that he's such a good addition because I already talked about all those guys that you have on the D line. Um, you know, Brandon Dorless being one of them, Casey Rogers, Jordan Birch, I think can really help Oregon have, you know, a bunch of different options along that defensive line all the best defenses in college football, they don't have just one solid defensive lineman. They have multiple guys across the board, across that defensive line that can knock back the offensive line, stop the run, and then most importantly, get after the quarterback. That is obviously the area that Oregon's defense has been lacking in the most over these past couple of years, and that's an area for growth here in spring football. So I think Jordan Birch obviously gives Oregon a very, very uh, you know high ceiling guy. Um, High floor too, I'd say, you know, coming over from the SEC, right? But that was a massive recruiting win for the Ducks in this offseason, adding some experience and uh, some decent production as well from his previous stop at South Carolina. But looking behind them, you know, or looking ahead of them rather, what does the depth look like at a edge rusher outside linebacker for Oregon? I think it's uh, it's a little bit uncertain right now. Um, you know, you have Mateo Uyunglele, who enrolled early at Oregon as one of the headliners in that class. Uh, big early signing day commitment for the Ducks. And you see the pictures of Mateo. I mean, he, he's supposed to be a senior in high school right now. And, and he looks like he's fitting in there, at least physically, with some of these big defensive linemen on Oregon's roster. You know, he's 6'5", 250 around there. 
Um, so I know fans are really excited to see what he can do. And I think guys like him, guys like Tatum Tuioti, Blake Purchase, Jaden Moore, also an early enrollee on campus. Blake Purchase is not enrolled yet, but he's a big time guy to keep an eye on because this lack of depth, uh, you know, for an edge rusher, for outside linebacker, it, it could put Oregon in the position where they need some of these younger guys to contribute. Uh, so I think that that's kind of exciting, you know, maybe a little bit, uh, not quite the you know position you want to be in, but I think that there's a couple of guys, Ashton Porter is another really talented guy, Under Armour All-American in the 2023 recruiting class that the Ducks got out of Texas. He's another guy that could find his way into that too deep right now. Um, I think another guy I wanted to mention, maybe not so much on the outside, because I think they've kicked him inside a little bit, is Jake Shipley. Um, I think he he's starting to look like he's progressing more at Oregon and he's kind of seeing the field a little bit more. Um, but you got some some pretty solid options along, uh, you know, along the outside linebacker. It's just in terms of it's a question of can these guys develop? Can they take that next step to ultimately see the field um, in, in 2023? So you got some good options there. Uh, you have your mainstays with Funa and, and Birch as well. Um, but I think you kind of maybe find yourself looking for some more depth after you look at uh, at those guys. So I think Oregon's got some some really solid depth on the interior and uh you know you're kind of looking for some more answers looking for some more dudes as you uh you know kind of look on the outside of that front seven and it's going to be a major storyline to track here in spring football another question that uh dan lanning and tosh lapoy find themselves asking is who steps up at inside linebacker for oregon uh, this was a group that wasn't necessarily super deep last year, but you did have Noah Sewell as the headliner of that group, the face of Oregon's inside linebackers, who will now be coached by Brian Michalowski, who comes over from Oregon State um, after Jake Long returned to Alabama. But Noah Sewell leaves, and uh, that's going to be a pretty big departure for Oregon. But they've done a good job. The staff has done a good job of finding some pieces, adding some pieces to the mix, that can uh, keep this as a really strong group. Jeffrey Bossa is the key returner for Oregon from a season ago at inside linebacker. You'll remember he came to Oregon as a safety, but he's looking more comfortable after his second full season playing inside linebacker. Um, and then you also have Keith Brown. Keith Brown was playing some pretty good football last year. He looks like he's getting more comfortable. He's going to be more reliable the more football he plays. He was looking like a stud. And that Holiday Bowl, you know, that was kind of a little bit of a shootout between Oregon and North Carolina back in December. But Keith Brown looks like he's finding his way into the, up the depth chart a little bit more. Um, and then you have some young guys that I think are really intriguing and kind of exciting, right? You have Devin Jackson and Harrison Taggart from the 2022 recruiting class. They, I think they both redshirted last year, or maybe one of them burned a redshirt. But they're young guys. They have a year in the system under their belts now. And um, those guys can fly. They can really move around. And Oregon needs them to move around because that group really struggled in coverage last year. Um, but Harrison Tagger and Devin Jackson had a, had a lot of speed coming out of high school. Now the kind of challenge is, you know, I think a lot of it falls on Wilson Love. You know, how do you get these guys to have college football-ready bodies put on weight to their frames because they're relatively light? but you don't want to sacrifice that speed. You want to make sure you hang on to as much of that speed as possible because we know the value that it carries with uh, linebackers. Uh, and then another guy that we have to talk about is Jamal Hill. Jamal Hill is a guy who came to Oregon in 2019 as a safety out of the state of Georgia. And he's, he's had some moments. He's had some flashes. we got to mention that Pac-12 title game. Uh, against USC in 2019 as kind of his breakout game, his, his welcome to college football game. Um, but he hasn't really been able to replicate that production. And that's a crowded safety room. You got him, Steve Stevens, Brian Addison, and then you add in Taishim Johnson and Evan Williams from the transfer portal. Uh, Trajan Williams is there. JJ Greenfield is there. Cody DeCambra looks like he's going to be joining the Ducks from the 2023 recruiting class in the spring. Tyler Turner is already on campus. So that is a really crowded safety room. So I think that the Oregon staff probably, you know, looked at their room and they were saying, okay, this is what we got. We got a lot of returners, not really any dudes at, in that room, you know, guys that you just cannot afford to keep off the field. Why not experiment with Jamal Hill at linebacker? And that's kind of what Dan Lanning confirmed a little bit 
you know, saying that Jamal Hill is, is they're tinkering with him at linebacker a little bit here in, uh, in spring football. And he's a guy who is a bigger safety, um, you know, I want to say six foot plus and, you know, kind of 210, 215. So maybe they're able to add some more weight there. And um, maybe he can help the Ducks cover some guys coming out of the backfield or cover some tight ends uh, on Dan Landing and Tosh LePoy's defense here in 2023. So that's another, you know, kind of development that we're going to have to keep a close eye on here in spring ball. And then how about the transfers? Got to talk about those transfers at inside linebacker. We're looking at Justin Jacobs from Iowa. He's already drawing some buzz as a top 2024 NFL draft prospect. He was banged up last year. He had a pretty solid career at Iowa, but I think there's a lot of excitement around him working with this star-studded defensive staff at Oregon. Um, you know, he's a physical guy, 6'4". Uh, I've seen 220. I've seen 240. I got to just see what those updated weight is looking like for Justin Jacobs, but He's a physical guy. He can cover, and he also has some additional upside as a pass rusher. So Justin Jacobs is another guy you got to be excited about. I think he probably projects as a plug-and-play starter for Oregon at inside linebacker. And there was a little bit of uh, an under-the-radar addition at inside linebacker with former Arizona State linebacker Connor Soley. He comes over from Tempe, uh, a guy who played his high school football in the state of Arizona, was a, a former safety himself. I think former safeties or former defensive backs that come down to play linebacker are always really, really intriguing because they're twitchy, they're fast, they're quick. Um, but it's just kind of seeing how how does their skill set still kind of line up with some other linebackers when they're not that big, and um, you know how do they do in the run game? You know how do they match up against tight ends? Um, so he was kind of a tweener coming out of high school, seeing that he was a converted safety, but obviously he found his fit at linebacker. And I think that he's a guy that you're going you're gonna to want to watch at inside linebacker for Oregon moving forward. So the Ducks need someone to step up at, a, at inside linebacker, and they have a number of uh, pretty capable options, I think, that will help them kind of answer that question or at least leave spring football feeling a little bit more confident about that inside backer spot. The Oregon tight end room is still lacking depth. This has been kind of a, a main concern or a main focus for uh, our breakdown of Oregon's offense here in the spring. Right now, Oregon's only rostering three scholarship tight ends. You know who they are, but in case you don't, I'll go ahead and run through them. Terrence Ferguson, you got Patrick Herbert, and you got Kenyon Sadiq, the youngin from the 2023 recruiting class who's already on campus and enrolled. He was a Gatorade Player of the Year in Idaho, and um, he really... I think brings a lot of pass catching ability to that room. But T Ferg, man, I mean, T Ferg has just continued to ascend as one of the top players on Oregon's offense after coming to Oregon in 2021, really seeing a lot of good playing time alongside Maliki Matavau, who has since transferred to UCLA this off season. T Ferg is going to be the man at tight end for Oregon, but obviously we know that Kenny Dillingham at Oregon last year liked to deploy multiple tight ends at the same time. That 14J package, if it's something that they want to continue doing, you're going to have to go out into the portal probably and get another tight end. We know that that's going to be a main priority for this Oregon staff with the transfer portal set to open again in May. But Patrick Herbert, P. Herbo, you know, Justin's little brother coming from Sheldon as well, you know, kind of a pride of Eugene story. I think there's reason to be excited about him because he had that touchdown. I want to say it was his first college touchdown against Cal last year. And he looked like a beast in the open field. You know, get that guy the ball, and, you know, he's not going to be easy to bring down. I think Terrence Ferguson is definitely your top pass catcher, but I don't think we've seen the best football that Patrick Herbert has in store. And he played his first full college season last year. You know the story with him. He's been at Oregon for a number of years. I think it was originally uh, from the class of 2019, and he just always was getting injured, you know, really terrible injury luck. I think both of those knees had some pretty serious injuries, but – he played his first full college season last year. Got a knock on wood here. I uh, never want anyone to get injured. But he comes into the 2023 season with some of that under his belt. And I think that that probably does some good stuff for your confidence, right? We we probably don't even talk enough about the, the mental toll that these injuries can take on these guys. And I think that that's a huge takeaway for last season. Maybe Patrick Herbert wasn't putting up, you know, amazing numbers. But just for a guy like him, you know, or a guy like Cam McCormick, who's at Miami now, I'm sure we can kind of lump those guys together a little bit because they've both been injured so much. I think that they would, they would definitely tell you 
just the value of being able to go through a full season has. You're not you're not over there with coaches telling you, hey man, just you know take those mental reps, you know stay in the gym working on your upper body because that's what you can work on. No, he was on the field. He was going through it. So he's looking a lot more comfortable. He has a year, a uh, full year playing with Bo Nix, as does Terrence Ferguson. And then Kenyon Sadiq, like I said, really talented pass catcher um, at, uh, at Skyline High School out of Idaho Falls. They were using him sometimes to take the top off of a defense, you know, uh, as a really fast tight end at 6'4", 220. So you get a lot, a guy with a lot of pass catching ability, high upside player, um, but now the the task kind of becomes, you know, getting his body adapted to the college game um, because he's not really, you know, right now he's not really in the position to block for you. And he's going to have to block some pretty big tight ends. We know that Oregon loves to run the ball. I think that he's an interesting player to keep an eye on in spring because, like I said, just because of the lack of depth here, um, you know, he's going to be asked to probably do more than he was maybe expecting. Or maybe they already told him before he got to Eugene, hey, man, you know, you're our tight end in this class, and we don't have a whole lot of tight ends right now, so we're going to need you to, to be a sponge. We're going to need you to just take it and run with it. Um, so I think that, you know, kind of monitoring his confidence and, and how he does, how he's moving out there, how he's, um, you know, doing with the playbook, that's, those are all factors that we have to keep our eye on here. And um, we saw the tight ends get much more involved last year. And I think that that should still be a, a mainstay of Will Stein's offense as he comes in and looks to, to leave his imprint on this offense. But, you know, I think you'd be foolish to not look at what worked last year and try to keep some of that continuity. You know, if it were, if it's working, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, the tight ends were much more involved last year after primarily being used as run blockers. Uh, we all know how that can get. Uh, a little bit boring if we see too much of that, but uh, they got a, tight, a talented tight end room and they're going to be looking for more pieces in the portal. You know, a number of them uh, have entered recently. I want to say Malcolm Epps from USC was an experienced guy that entered the portal recently. Uh, I know Ole Miss had a guy that entered the, the transfer portal at tight end recently. Uh, his name's escaping me right now, but we do know that Oregon has a connection to Ole Miss with a uh, uh, Jaworski Beckham and Wilson Love coming over from Oxford to join Dan Lanning's staff. So you have some of those connections. You know, you've got to look at where Oregon's coaches were before they got to Oregon. Um, and, uh, you know, we just try to kind of follow the roadmap if we can back to these players. But we know Oregon needs a tight end uh, before next season, and they're going to be looking in the transfer portal to find that guy. So tight end room still lacks depth, but it's a, it's a good room. And um, I think that you should be, you know, you're happy about where the starters are, but you want to have, like we were talking about with Bo Nix and the quarterbacks, you want to have options in case anyone gets hurt or has to miss any kind of time. Because right now, Patrick Herbert goes down, Terrence Ferguson goes down, Kenyon Sadiq's, you know, a starter. And um, I don't know how he's going to do with that kind of a role. I don't think that we've seen enough of him at the college level to kind of speculate there, but you can kind of see what I'm trying to get at. You know, that's not the situation that you want to put yourself in. So we got to see what Oregon does to address the tight end depth moving forward. And those are some of the top storylines that we have as the Ducks continue to prepare for spring football, which resumes next week, Tuesday, April 4th in Eugene. The Ducks will practice three times a week uh, throughout the month of April. They're going to be practicing on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, with Saturday being a uh, common day for a scrimmage. And um, that's just kind of the way that Dan Lanning has chosen to work his schedule. We know that the uh, spring practices are all working towards and culminating with the spring game on Saturday, April 29th in Eugene at Autzen Stadium. And then the Ducks will conclude spring practice that following Monday, which I believe is May 1st. And then the coaches are going to get out on the road uh, for, an, for a very important spring evaluation period. They're going to be going all over the country to visit some of their top targets in the 2024 class. And, you know, things are really heating up, right? We talked about Elijah rushing. He's going to be on campus, five-star edge rusher. And then today, Friday, Colin Simmons, five-star edge rusher out of Duncanville, Texas. That's a national power. Then you got Dylan Rayola, a five-star quarterback, number one player in the 2024 recruiting class. He's going to be on campus as well. And then you also have Dylan Stewart, another elite edge rusher, five-star caliber guy from Washington, D.C. He's going to be on campus as well. And then another talented guy out of Texas, uh, Xavier Phil Simi. Uh, it looks like after putting Oregon in his top five earlier this week, still Steve Wiltfong is reporting 
Um, I believe it was this morning. He's reporting that it looks like he might be out in Eugene for that Oregon spring game as well. So as we know, all these visits are just, you know, culminating and building towards that big spring game for the Ducks. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anybody else that I know that's going to be uh, in town. I think another guy to watch uh, going back to the state of Mississippi at Picayune High School is Jamonte Waller. He is a, a five-star edge rusher as well in the 2024 recruiting class. Uh, I believe by 24-7 Sports, they rated him a five-star in their updated rankings of 32 five-star prospects. So Jamonte Waller, another name to watch. Got programs like Alabama, Penn State, Ole Miss, so many powerhouse programs that are all involved there with Jamonte Waller. And you know that Ole Miss and Lane Kiffin probably learned their lesson about letting the top players in Mississippi leave the state to play his college ball with Oregon. He's a big time running back who's already enrolled going through spring practice with the Ducks. But it's going to be a massive, massive month of recruiting for Oregon. And I can't wait for it. Excited to get rolling again with these football stories. Um, and you guys can find all of my written work on ducksdigest.com. Make sure you tap in with me, lock in with me on your uh, on social media. I am at mtorissports, that name right there on your screen, on both Twitter and Instagram. And make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel, Oregon Football Max Taurus. But until next time, appreciate you guys taking some time out of your day to talk some duck football with me. And we will catch you in the next episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast.